Primeiramente, pedir desculpa pelo atraso, não é alguma coisa que, é, que dependa de mim, porque eu estou organizando isso e é uma série de atividades, série de providências que eu tenho que tomar. E eu só tenho essa hora entre, entre a hora do almoço, igual que eu peço perdão pelo atraso. Nós vamos hoje, então, receber e ouvir nosso querido professor Roberto e tendo como moderadores o professor é, Torquato Castro Júnior e o professor Frederico Kelly. É, tendo, tendo visto adiantado a hora, eu sem maiores delongas passo a palavra para o professor Roberto. Thank you very much for everybody being here. Thank you, George, for uh, the invitation for this. Colloquy. Um, the talk I'm going to give today is about normativity, and uh, the reason why I, I, I chose this topic is because, of course, anybody working with law uh, has an interest in norms, and it's even the, the main object of, uh, of legal study of, of, of any kind. And, um, and so I wanted to, to provide a sort of large picture, a large account of a uh, of normativity in a, in, a, in, a, in a very broad perspective, so I'm trying to, to sketch a very general account uh, where it, that won't be um, much uh, talk about pragmatism, but the understanding of normativity I, I deploy is in fact um, assumes some uh, very broad uh, uh, pragmatist understanding and notably the idea that uh, um, our normative attitudes is shaped and depends upon uh, the endorsement uh, um, of explicit norms as well as on, uh, on the habits and, uh, and, and, and tested way of, uh, of, um, of engaging the, the normative dimension. And, uh, and this is the reason why I'm, I'm using this expression, the normative creature, just to, to mark the fact that uh, there is a uh, the involvement of, of human being with uh, normativity uh, goes much farther than uh, the rational uh, um, acceptance or critique of norms, of explicit norm having a propositional form. And uh, so, but my, but my point won't be that this dimension is not important or it is wrong to think about it. It's just to, to show that uh, this explicit, uh, discursive, uh, reflexive, deliberative uh, deliberate uh, dimension of normativity is a set of top of a much larger iceberg and uh, what I want to do is to speak about this broader part of uh, the normative picture so one of the first point I want to uh, I want to make is that normativity is one of the traits that distinguishes us as human being from all other animal species and provides the core of what I call our ethical and political life, of our ethical project. And so uh, I think that a normative idea, some understanding of what normativity is, is always presupposed by moral and political discourse, any kind of moral and political discourse. So that one, one cannot hope grasp the meaning of most of contemporary moral and political controversies without having an idea of what does it mean to be a normative creature. So this talk is going to be divided into three parts. In the first part I explain what normativity is and why we should care about it. In the second I introduce you to the three most important ways of conceiving the domain of normativity and will offer you some key to understand uh, what, I, what I call uh, normative practices and you will see of course that uh, law is typically one among many other normative practices at the end of this talk uh, my, my intention, my idea is to, to try to, persu to persuade you that you should, you should see that what is apparently abstract like normative practices of justification and critique um, 
are just uh, a transformation, a derivation of everyday practices into which we all engage any time we are troubled by the normative orders that govern our associated life. So we, you will see here another thread of this pragmatist understanding of rationality, which is the focus on, uh, on problematic situations in everyday life. So normativity is one of the core features of human associated life and one which distinguishes humans from any other animal species. That we control our behavior through norms and values we design and modify is one of the salient adaptive competencies of the human species. Differently put, our living together presupposes the capacity to fix norms of conduct as well as that of revising them once they come to stand in the way of our <coughs> associated undertakings. Our constant talk of correct and incorrect, good and bad, rational and irrational, right and wrong, valid and invalid, mark clearly our everyday involvement with normativity. What I call normativity is precisely this capacity, exclusive to human beings, to set and revise norms of conduct, that is to say to balance the power of instinct with the self-control of intelligence. This self-critical attitude is tied to the capacity to distinguish right from wrong. And it seems that a sense of justice is rooted in our natural constitution. Rather than being learned or acquired through culture, the sense of justice seems to be innate in human beings, and with it comes our sensitivity for injustices. Human beings, contrary to all other living creatures, not only perceive what is being done to them, but are capable of evaluating it against an idea of what they take to be the right or just way to treat them. This is unique to our species, and this is why I call the human being the normative creature. So normativity creates a gap between us and the other living creatures, and an everyday example we showed this to us. When, for example, you feed your pets, your cats, your dogs, they are generally concerned merely, simply, with the amount of what they get. If you give more to, to eat to one than to another, the one who has received less will not appear to be concerned by that, provided that what he received is enough for his needs. So it doesn't compare. If you do the same thing with human beings, you will immediately realize that they are responsive both to what they receive and to the relation between what they have received and what they think they should have received. They respond to the normative dimension of distribution, not only to the economical or quantitative. So the sense of justice comes before modern political ideas of equality and takes priority over it. It grants our capacity for normativity and constitutes, constitutes us as normative creatures. That is to say, as creatures capable of perceiving and thinking in terms of right and wrong, rather than only in terms of enough and not enough, or of useful and useless. So there is a, uh, a sharp distinction between uh, justice and usefulness, or quantity, or economy. And I think this should be uh, stressed against a sort of very common understanding of pragmatism as being a utilitarian doctrine. Pragmatism is not utilitarian, and uh, I think the best proof of it is that it can, it can root an understanding of normativity as being uh, uh, irreducible to mere, uh, mere economicism or utilitarianism. So my point is that since the very beginning, human beings have developed a sense for justice, and they've won the struggle for survival thanks to their capacity to form sophisticated social arrangements whose function relies upon normative orders and upon the normative practices through which they are entertained and adjust. So normative orders guide human conduct because they take care of the normative dimension of distribution. Moral codes, like they want to be found in religions and philosophy, and philosophies, explicit rules such as legal systems, public institutions such as democracy, ritual practices such as in religions again, codes of etiquette, procedures such as those to be found within public and private organizations, are whole different examples of implements 
through which only a normative creature can be in the world. Now, in the Western philosophical tradition since Plato and Aristotle, it is customary to claim that normative orders should rely on reasons. Normativity, philosophers like to say, is granted in rationality, find it, it finds its reason, finds in reason its last and lasting basis. At the same time, our historically minded culture has brought us to the awareness that normative standards, rules, values, principles, are subject to historical and cultural evolution. This awareness was distilled out of the extremely violent religious wars that plagued Europe during the 17th century and that the Europeans tried to overcome via what is now known as the Enlightenment. Most of our present struggle with cultural integration, religious freedom, racial discrimination, international affairs depends upon the way we resolve this tension between reason and history. Battles over, over the beginning of life, vision of a just society, political implications of world religious clashes, but in nature. Our freedom to invent the norm we live by has become very soon a duty to fashion the norms without which we cannot live. And therefore, as a, as a consequence of this historical process, in our present culture, the need for rational justification and the awareness of historicity coexist, and their coexistence explains why conflict and disagreement are endemic to democracy and contemporary moral life. Indeed, in the context of an increasingly flexible and globalized world like our own, two sets of events come to stress our normative attitudes. On the one hand, everything around us changed much faster than ever, this is true not only for technology and economic relations, and as you see in countries growing very fast like Brazil these days, but also for values and normative orders. The reduced life cycle of value systems make changes in normative orientations more frequent and dramatic, so that one of us in his life career is likely to pass through diverse systems of values and to have to revise his moral and political orientations with a frequency that was simply unknown to our forefathers. On the other hand, the process of globalization increases the chances for individuals to get to, get to know a plurality of different value systems, and this simple fact exposes every one of us to the question of the, of the legitimacy of each and of their, of their comparative validity. Virtual and physical communication, the circulation of goods, of works of art, and of theories exposes each of us, each one of us, to several often incompatible systems of values and puts upon each of us a duty of accountability for the values and norms he freely decides to endorse. So modernity and globalization leaves us with a problem unknown to our, to our ancestors, that of developing a new attitude of flexibility and of critical responsiveness to normative orders. And I think law is typically one of the ways we deal with this new problem. And what we say yesterday, for example, about abduction as a way of reasoning in the face of unexpected cases is typical, a typical of example of how we try to deal with, uh, with changing normative orders uh, through fixed and rigid normative uh, practices. So our forefathers could still receive their basic moral values through primary education and live on them their entire life. New generation now cannot hope to live their whole life on what their parents have taught them and may be required to revise their moral, social, and political beliefs more than once in their life. Therefore, as normative creatures, we are passing a decisive evolutionary threshold, and to do this, we need to acquire new competencies. As I will show you what follows, we must learn new normative practices if we want to succeed in dealing with the manifold normative controversies that plague our all, all modern democratic societies. So now I'm going to describe a couple of these uh, very general uh, theoretical patterns through which this normative stance has been work, worked out, thought about in, uh, in the Western tradition. So the intuition I want to work out today is that to satisfy the sense of justice in time of rapid, of rapid material and cultural change, human beings had to develop new normative practices 
practices through which they transform the normative orders on which they rely for distributing resources and for granting reciprocal recognition. I begin with what is the most classical, and for this reason the less original conception of normative practices. It is the conception that lies at the heart of our most basic intuitions about the attitude, the structure, the moral and the political domain. And I will present you this conception in the terms of one of the greatest political philosophers of the 20th century, the American pragmatist John Dewey. You have been hearing about him in the, in the, in the, in the last days. If I have chosen Dewey's description, it is not for its originality. In fact, it has none, at least on this point. It has many originalities, Dewey's, but not on what I'm saying now. But because Dewey introduces this very conventional distinction, only to overcome it in his search for a different understanding of what normativity is. So let's start from the beginning. In a series of lectures delivered in China in 1920, Dewey proposed to define the political arena by bringing all political positions back to, to two original attitudes, which are those of radicalism and conservatism. These attitudes, as Dewey contends, are not merely political labels to identify opposing political parties, but descriptions of broad types of human characters or temperaments. What Dewey calls a radical is someone who, I'm quoting Dewey now, is dissatisfied with the sharply critical and sharply critical of existing social institutions. He deplores what he sees about him and proposes idealistic utopian schemes. He is not interested in improving what exists, but advocates replacing it with something entirely new and different. His theories tend to be destructive rather than constructive. End of quote. On the other hand, a conservative is, is someone who generally comes after the radical and that, I'm putting Dewey again, sets forth theoretical basis for the perpetuation of the social and political schemes of his time, end of quote. Even if he may be dissatisfied with existing institutions, he is persuaded that, I'm, I'm putting again Dewey, each institution evolved to serve a human need that it has what might be called an original meaning. Certainly, a given institution may have deteriorated because people lost sight of the purpose it was originally intended to serve. But for the, for the, for the conservative then, the task of normative practices is to restore this original meaning rather than to replace the institution. End of quote. For the conservative, the realization of an improved society has to be achieved within existing institutions. Whereas for the radical, such an achievement must be found in some utopian realm. According to Dewey, human beings tend generally to privilege either one or the other of these attitudes in critical ways. Dewey sees in the historical law the fact that from time from time immemorial, mankind has been subject to two errors. And that in time of crisis, men have tended to be either too radical or too conservative. They have fallen into what Dewey calls the trap of either or, tending to regard everything around themselves either as good or bad, either as deserving critique or justification. For Dewey, this is a very bad understanding of normativity, an understanding that calls for what he saw as a third philosophy, and that they propose instead to call a third, or in any way, an alternative conception of normativity, a way which would be freed from the trap of the either-or. For Dewey, we should, each one of us should, try to resist our temperament and relocate our conservative or radical aspirations within the larger framework of we as normative creatures. I come now to the second picture of normativity, a picture that has a much longer and much more prestigious intellectual pedigree, as it comes straight from modern European philosophy. This conception relies on a sharp opposition between, once again, two fundamental and opposite normative attitudes. So you see how these dualisms comes again and again from different quarters of, of, of uh, Western civilization. 
We can call uh, these two opposite attitudes uh, a romantic critique uh, and enlightened critique. These two attitudes are at the origin of modern moral and political thought and they're not two equally opposite and irreducible attitudes toward normativity. To explain what I mean by these two expressions, let's turn to two of the greatest modern philosophers, Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Jean Locke. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was from Geneva and uh, who lived uh, in the, was born in 1712 and died in uh, 1778, is the founding figure of, figure of what I've called the Romantic Critique. So what is the idea, the main idea of the Romantic Critique? The Romantic Critique sees human nature as good and sees in social life the origin of all evils. For the Romantic Critique, human beings are good, nat are good natured. They come to life as natural being and dominated by what Rousseau called amour de soi. Amour de soi is a form of self-love that aims at self-preservation. In the state of nature, Rousseau contends, men aim only to, to perpetuate themselves. And this form of self-love that has no social counterpart is the source of humanity and of moral virtues. However, once human beings become socialized, a second form of self-love that Rousseau calls amour propre emerges. Contrary to the first, this second form of self-love brings us in competitions the one against the other. Under the pressure of self-love, our self-realization depends more and more on the opinion of others. So that social life is now dominated by the unrest of a permanent self-exhibition and by a competitive search for reputation and prestige. This fact brings social life to a state of deep instability, conflict, and personal unhappiness, as self-affirmation is pursued at the expense of, of others' reputation. The entire life is transformed in a vanity fair. So for the romantic critique, social life is pathologically ill since, it, since, since its very beginning, and only the living can save us from the evils the social life instill into an otherwise good nature. The myth of the, of the good savage, the longing for an immediate contact with nature, are some of the forms through which this myth finds expression. One, only, one has only to think then at classic literary works such as Robinson Crusoe, or to contemporary film of someone has seen this film uh, Into the Wild, <coughs> to see the force of that romantic critique continue to exercise on our imagination. Now, in opposition to the romantic critique, stands what I've called the Enlightenment critique, whose first modern representatives are John Locke, who came a little bit before um, Rousseau, and David Hume, who was exactly a contemporary of Rousseau. But whose most paradigmatic representative is perhaps John Stuart Mill, Contrary to the Romantic critique, the Enlightenment critique does not pit society against nature. Enlightenment critiques such as Locke, Hume, or Mill all reject explicitly the idea that social life is inevitably tainted with turmoil and unhappiness. The Enlightenment critique believes that social orders can be good or bad, of course, and that it is, but, but that it is up to us to improve the social order we inhabit. For the Enlightenment critic, normative orders are human artifacts and that we are, respo and we are responsible for their quality. A paradigmatic example of the Enlightenment critique is John Stuart Mill's denunciation of the subjection of women and his praise in favor of universal suffrage. The Enlightenment, the Enlightenment critic is a reformer. Neither a radical nor a conservative, he thinks that normative orders are tools for improving human life. And it is with this attitude that he engages in the normative practice of critique. He criticizes, criticizes existing normative orders only to propose better one. As it was the case with the Romantic critique, also the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment critique is still with us. So it's not just a figure of the past. You can find uh, several, several Enlightenment critiques in contemporary moral and political philosophy, and I think that figures like John Dewey or Michael Walter, uh, like on the other hand, for example, uh, Axel Onet, uh, most of the representative of the critical theory uh, tradition, belong rather to the camp of, uh, of romantic critique. They have always this 
this nostalgic understanding of um, of, um, of something which was there before a society or a capitalism just destroyed our social uh, identity. I come now to the third image, which is an image that in my, in my view best captures the situation of contemporary moral and political philosophy. So I'm giving you this, this, this image as a sort of understanding of what happens uh, in the moral and political philosophy that is being worked out in Europe and the United States. I know much less about, I may have to say about political philosophy in, uh, in Brazil. So it, this image represents, once again, normativity as being dominated by two general and irreducible normative attitudes. Whereas according to our first model, the fundamental normative attitudes were those of radicalism and conservatism, and whereas according to the second model, the main distinction passed between a romantic and, a, and an enlightened form of critique, according to the third, the main normative attitudes are those of justification and critique. Justification and critique are dominant normative practices that define general and basic attitudes toward norms and values. As in the other two cases, this distinction too tries to grasp the essential features of our normative stance. Political theory, especially in the Anglo-American world, is in fact dominated by the image of human beings as justific justificatory creatures. That is to say, creatures that are essentially defined by their ability to justify and to ask for justifications. The justificatory conception of normativity aims to reconstruct the whole edifice of morality and politics from the idea that as human beings we are originally committed to our right to justification. According to this view, what qualifies us as human beings is that we are endowed with an in, 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 inalienable right to justification, according to, it, to which we should receive a proper justification for any action or decision whose consequences may affect our life. Correspondently, each of us has a duty to justification, that is to say, an obligation to justify to his fellow human beings those decisions or acts that may have consequences upon their life. According to this perspective, justification is the most important normative practice. Justifications increase the value of what they justify and provide the legitimacy to what we think and do. Therefore, it is a valuable practice in which we must engage to preserve the normative order of the society in which we live. Now, opposite to this image stands the conception of normativity as critique, a conception according to which what qualifies us as normative creatures is our capacity to criticize. Critical theory has traditionally conceived the goal of all intellectual undertakings to consist in criticizing existing normative orders to the extent that they are conducive to forms of human suffering. The critical tradition takes upon itself to denounce and unmask those aspects of modern society, and notably of the capitalist society that emerges after modernity, that produce human suffering, and it takes upon itself the duty to denounce distorted, alienated, pathological, or reifying social situations. It searches for causes of suffering and fostered processes of social transformation. Whereas the justificatory program asks for the condition of validity of present orders, making legitimacy depending upon justification, the critical program asks for the causes that make the present world an illegitimate source of suffering. I'm approaching now to my conclusions. These three models that have evolved historically out of, uh, out of uh, Western culture frame our understanding of the attitude we should take in the face of the norms and values that shape our collective life and that determine our understanding of what does it mean to be a good citizen or a just human being. These are not only the models through which the Western civilization has framed its own self-understanding in the moral and political domain, but are also the models through which it continues to understand itself. Each of us, willing or not, 
and the sets himself to one or the other of the categories I have rapidly sketched as a conservative or a radical, as a romantic or, a, or an enlightened critic, as a justification-minded or a critically-minded self-aware citizen. Yet all these models are plugged by the same difficulty. So this is the critical point I want to make as a conclusion. A difficulty that should motivate us to go beyond all of them while preserving the good intuitions each of them incorporates. <coughs> At the beginning of my talk, I, re I referred to what John Dewey called a third philosophy and that he saw in the overcoming of the either-or error. I want to conclude this talk by pointing toward the necessity to come back to this program, to start seeing normativity on a broader basis, a basis that can encompass at the same time the radical and the conservative, <coughs> the romantic and the enlightened, justification and critique. It is a conception of human beings as normative creatures, as creatures involved in many forms of normative practices. If you come back to the naturalistic picture I have given you at the start of my talk, it is easy to see that radicalism and conservatism, reformism and criticism, justification and critique, are essential and complementary attitudes each of us performs in the everyday interaction with the norms and values that texture social life. We criticize discourses and actions we disagree with, and we justify orders that we take to be legitimate. At the same time, we reform, adjust, and repair the rules and convention within the by. Just to say it in a word, we deal with our normative orders as a mechanic, we deal with the machine, by repairing and doing maintenance work anytime things go wrong. What Otto Neurath, which was a great German philosopher of science, said once of language, uh, I think it can be said also uh, of the moral order that sustain our collective life. And so, as users of normative orders, I'm quoting Otto Neurath, we are like, this is a very famous quotation, we are like sailors who must rebuild their ships on the open sea, never able to dismantle it in dry rock and to reconstruct it there, there out of the best materials. So what does this metaphor tell us? It tells that normative orders cannot be addressed with one-sided attitudes and that in the face of values and norms we, like the sailors mentioned above, can only do repair work while being on board. We cannot step outside our normative orders so as to criticize or justify them for saying that we, like sailors, cannot leave the ship means that justification and critique are local normative practices to be used according to specific normative needs. No matter whether we are political philosophers, politicians, lawyers, ordinary citizens, we are all on the same boat all having to do with the same normative orders, all involved in this repairing work. The ship must go on sailing, as the ship is the, as the, ship is the society in which we live. Sometimes ships go out of the sea for deep maintenance, but this happens very rarely. For the most of their life, ships stay at sea, and maintenance is being done while sailing, which means that we need to rely on some part of our normative orders, either to justify or criticize other parts. This is also our destiny as normative creatures. We must take some norms and values to be valid, to be able to justify or criticize other norms or values. Once we adopt this broader view of normativity, we realize that neither the justificatory nor the critical program pay the needed attention to the normative attitude that, that characterizes our relationship to the world. They both neglect the tacit and pro reflective dimension of our normative engagement with the social world and fail to see the contextual and functional nature of normative practices. But they neglect, too, the importance of those reconstructed normative practices through which we challenge our fellow citizens and defy our society with a variety of aims hardly reducible to those of justifying or criticizing. On the account I sketched, justification and critique, correctly understood as normative practices, are downsized from the position of final ends of our intellectual undertakings to that of means to which we resort in our normative engagements. Seeing, <coughs> seeing ourselves as normative creatures means acknowledging that these basic normative attitudes 
are always and already at play in our everyday interactions with others. We engage in justification and critique with our dearest friends and beloved. We behave radically or conservatively in the apparently smooth interaction with people we encounter in our offices, in our everyday undertakings, university colleagues, stranger on a bus, official within public offices, sometimes playing the romantic critique, sometimes the self-critical enlightenment. It is by understanding that we are normative creatures, naturally and evolved beings that mediate between themselves and the world through the fixation of beliefs that we can come to see the importance to adjust our normative practices to the ever-changing needs of constantly evolving social situations. We will then be in the, in the position to appreciate the unique and yet partial relevance of all the normative practices that these models have identified and to acknowledge that it is only by integrating them in a unified picture of ourselves as normative creatures that we can hope to remain faithful to our normative nature, to the fact that we are normative creatures endowed with an ineradicable sense of justice bounded by our nature to the duty of justification and critique. Thank you. Bem, nós vamos então passar aos computadores e eu tenho que estabelecer algumas regras porque nós temos um tempo determinado que devemos preencher com... ainda temos a conferência final do professor Toscano e eu quero estabelecer algumas regras. É, a primeira delas é a seguinte, é, é, each, each One, each one of the commenters has 15 minutes to present his remarks. And Roberto has 20 minutes to answer his remarks. I keep it shorter than that. Okay. So uh, it, it, it's a rule in our. <laughs> it's not very fair, but. <laughs> It's a rule in our system of uh, meetings and so on that you you give first the, the, the opportunity to the visitors, you know, to people that is coming not uh, of yes. our own uh, program. So I I will give the word to Professor uh, Frederick Kellogg to present in the moment. Have you got a stopwatch? That you uh, tell me when I'm when my time is up, please. I might do it for you. You you do it, okay? <laughs> at, at, at 38, you stop. I knew I could. I knew I could count on Professor Torquato to keep me from get going on too long. Um, I would like to follow uh, uh, Roberto Frega's um, uh, presentation with a, um, a comment that's directly on point. Um, and um, the title of my comment is uh, Justice Holmes, uh, Law, and the Transformation of Justification. You, you heard how um, he described justification as, ha as emerging from earlier forms of uh, normativity and normative theory and thinking. Um, Uh, John Dewey um, considered Justice Holmes a great philosopher. That was back um, in the early part of the 20th century while Holmes was still alive. Uh, Holmes uh, died in, the, in 1931 uh, and for a while he had a almost mythal, mythological reputation. Um, but uh, as time went on Uh, his reputation was criticized and diminished um, due to what was considered to be his skepticism, which you might call his critical side. Uh, I'd like to talk about his other side, the justification side, um, and to use this as a vehicle to uh, describe um, the importance of law, the importance of lawyers, the importance of judges, the importance of legal scholars, and all of you who are thinking about being lawyers or studying law or being engaged in it 
uh, I'd like to try to um, um, pick, paint a picture of, uh, uh, of how you, you are engaged in the justificatory uh, system of society. Um, there's a, a short quote that I gave yesterday of Holmes in 1899 in a speech he said about the law, it is proper to regard and study the law simply as a great anthropological document. It is proper to resort to it to discover what ideals of society have been strong enough to reach that final form of expression, or what have been the changes in dominant ideals from century to century. It is proper to study it as an exercise in the morphology, that's the change, and transformation of human ideas. Now how did he come to this picture of transformation? Well actually, um, I have to go back in history because you may remember that Holmes was uh, a soldier in the American Civil War and the Civil War affected his thinking about order. Um, and he proposed a different um, image uh, of order, a dynamic and transformative image from that of Thomas Hobbes, who uh, in the 17th century proposed the dominant, still dominant picture of, of law as uh, gaining justification by the state, by the authority of the state, as long as they as a given law comes from the proper source uh, and has the proper seal of approval uh, and comes from the, a, a clearly a sovereign source, then it, it's a law and that's its basic justification. Um, well, Hobbes uh, ch changed the thinking uh, of, about law in the 17th century from the earlier common law attitude um, that m was expressed by scholars such as Matthew Hale, a famous English judge of the, of the 17th century. As how, how many people have heard of Matthew Hale? Very uh, uh, little known figure, but he used the exact same uh, s uh, metaphor at that the philosopher Otto Neurath used, that one about the ship, that we have, we're all in a ship and we have to uh, Go repair the ship even while we're sailing in it. Now that was Matthew Hale's image of the common law. Uh, and he said the common law is like a, shi a ship of state that has to be repaired while it's still going in the water. Um, well, he lost, he and the common lawyers lost the debate to Thomas Hobbes, uh, and Hobbes' authority uh, imagery of uh, legal justification won out. But when Holmes uh, emerged out of the Civil War and became a scholar, you may, you may remember that part of my talk, uh, he, he looked again, took a new look at the common law and became what I consider to be the last of the great common law theorists. Um, and uh, later on his reputation has uh, has been, I'd say, distorted, but to some degree, by that what I told you about that skeptical uh, side that he had. Well, the skeptical side came because of historical studies that he he made of uh, the common law over over the ages, and he saw a lot of irrational elements in it, a lot of traditional elements, the uh, the many of the same flaws that. You may remember Jeremy Bentham criticized in the law the you know the procedural uh, in, um, uh, delays and the uh, uh, um, illusory the use of fictions and so on and so forth. Well, Holmes saw that as as pretty much the product of history, but he also saw uh, the prospects for reform and change. He did not approve of. Uh, sudden over, overriding change by judges drawing on moral principles, but rather he saw a better role for change to take place by simply working out the conflicts in society. This is something that you, if you become lawyers, will be involved with. Working out the conflicts of society 
and at the edges of, of one um, side uh, and the other side of a particular conflict, that is where the conflicts are worked out on a case-by-case -case basis. And over time, principles are drawn from the results of each and, and every decision that you will help to make as lawyers. Um, in brief, uh, how this system of rules grew up over the common law system, you had activities, you may say, for example, uh, think back to the sa days of sailing ships, um, uh, sailing around uh, with limited navigation uh, in the night and in storms and so on, and, and then every now and then you have a collision among the ships. Uh, and uh, the, after the collision, someone wants to collect money for the injury done, and so who is at fault? That uh, decision has to be made. Uh, and as the decisions are made, um, uh, standards of safety come into play. For example, did a particular ship at night carry the proper light? You know, ships at night carry colored lights. Uh, the starboard on the uh, uh, on the right and the uh, I guess it's no, the starboard on the port and the green on the on the uh, uh, the red is which one is which? Red is port and green is starboard. Uh, and so uh, the. Over time, those standards of safety uh, find their way into the decisions of the courts and become part of the legal structure. Um, and uh, uh, that is how Holmes' uh, view of the law uh, was built, saw being built up over the, over the uh, historical record and replacing, replacing the earlier um, ethics of of vengeance and and a revenge that you find still um, uh, written of in the Bible, for example, in the Old Testament, you, you know, you may remember those famous passages of uh, revenge, an eye for an eye, and so on. Uh, well, that used to dominate uh, society's view of of law and and morals, and over time, that paradigm, as it were was replaced by a, a more rehabilitative and rational structure of rules, those which um, have been woven into a consistent whole by legal scholars and historians. So basically what we're, we're seeing here is the historical transformation of uh, the nature of justification over time, over history. And what role do we uh, individuals have in that? Um, well, if the, if the law is effective in resolving conflicts and not allowing them to fester to the point where we have strife and, and violence, as the Civil War was for Holmes as a soldier, um, if the law is effective in resolving those conflicts, then justification can be built on a case-by-case -case basis as rules and principles become embedded in our minds and practices and uh, our conduct it conforms to our moral, our moral code and vice versa. Um, so, um, in, in order to summarize what I'm saying here, uh, justification under this Holmes uh, picture or this Holmesian um, uh, vision is uh, more or less of a, an ongoing project rather than a simple formula. In other words, uh, you, you can't rely on something, some explanation, a simple explanation like the uh, social contract um, that Hobbes proposed, um, whereby you give up certain rights to the state and the state then uh, imposes order and authority on you. That is not a very effective um, uh, justification or ground for justification. What really uh, is, is the real justification in society is the continuing project of making the law uh, conform to rational, ethical, uh, ideal modes of conduct. And that Holmes, in another, in another quote, said the law is always 
approaching but never reaching consistency. Part of, the, of your project as legal scholars will be to keep the law approaching that consistency. Uh, so this dynamic model uh, uh, weaves together the two things that Roberto talked about at the end, the justification side and the critical side. Um, by understanding the, the historical record, by understanding the law as a great anthropological document, we understand also uh, the trials, the difficulties, the flaws, the, uh, the problems, the challenges, uh, and the technological methods whereby justification for society is attained over a long uh, and, and difficult struggle by those of us hopefully in the law uh, working uh, under the, the best of, of, our, of our intentions and, and, and uh, full knowledge of the realities. Um, so that's my comment on um, Roberto, and I think I came in under 15 minutes. One minute. Not that. O professor Roberto responderá as duas intervenções ao final. Eu gostaria, antes de passar a palavra ao professor Torquato, assinalar aqui a presença do nosso querido colega, professor, titular da, 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 da Faculdade de Direito e membro da nossa pós-graduação, desembargador do, da, do Tribunal Regional da Quinta Região. E graças a ele e ao professor Errar, foi possível que nós obtivéssemos esse espaço para que esse colóquio se realizasse. Por isso eu agradeço ao professor Francisco. E o professor Francisco será o presidente da conferência de encerramento. Um, good afternoon. I'll, I'll speak in English. <laughs> so that I can use the passages. Well, I, I want to begin with a register of my satisfaction because all these talks we have had have really, really just uh, wakened me to thinking and rethinking things I've been going through many times. We had really great opportunities of dialogue and this is rare. I'm so very happy and thankful for Professor George for that opportunity. And uh, I will address this paper that Professor Roberto Frega was so very kind to send me, send me yesterday and that which I read through and I have uh, recalled now through his reading. I would like to say that, well, I'm not properly a pragmatist, but I, I somehow envy pragmatism in a very, very broad way. Because in, that has to do with the way they use and the way they get rid of dualisms. And I see in this paper of Professor Frega an exercise of this ability that is very proper to pragmatism. He is not afraid of dualisms. He makes them useful and he might dismiss them when they become useless. And I see that Professor Frege is trying to do this in the, sense, in, the mean, in the sense that he is trying a broader view of something which was divided and he is trying to reach a point from where this division becomes somehow meaningless or weakened or perhaps more proper for a wider view of what happens to us human beings. But perhaps, perhaps I might be capable of addressing a pragmatist critique of his pragmatist approach. <laughs> I hope to do that. I hope to do that. In what sense? My criticism goes on the very, to the very core of his, his paper. This idea of a normative creature. Normative creature with which he wants to define human beings in contraposition to other animals. Really, I 
have been thinking this through for many, many years. I, I don't think we're much, well, that much different from other animals. I know this point of view is insulting in a way to certain thinkers. But I really do think we're like the other, well, very much like the other big apes. And together with me, I know there's a broad group of scientists. One of them I brought the book here is this Dutchman, Franz de Waal. And this book has been published in Brazil. I, the primate. So this kind of approach shows that we might have just, then we are um, like uh, ready to admit. And I, I remember uh, this, is this little story by Franz Kafka in which he tells about a monkey, an ape, who learns to talk. He begins to talk and he is able to deliver a briefing to an academy. The, 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 the story is called A Briefing to an Academy. And he says, he tells the story of how he became as well as educated as any other human being in his context. And there he speaks about the concept of human freedom. And that he doesn't like human freedom. And at a certain point he says that he is working in the circus because that's the only way he could be free. In a zoo, he wouldn't be free. So he chose to be in the circus once he spoke. And, and, and he says, well, I watched that woman hanged up very high in the teeth of another person, swinging around. That is human freedom. I don't like that. I just want a way out. <laughs> And, and the thing with the criticism uh, of this perspective is that, well, perhaps we think too much of this thing with freedom and humanity. And this is a Kantian view. This is something that is rooted in one of these traditions Professor Frey had addressed in his, in his conference. Well, I agree with that. I, I am very much in favor of his view that we should look uh, to broader view, to a broader view of, of these problems. And I'm a, I agree with him in this, in this assertive of his that the sense of justice seems to be in it, in human beings. But I don't think it is only in human beings. Actually, actually I think that it's false, one of in, uh, the information here, that the animals are incapable of have been feeling envy. Actually, I, I have seen some experiments showing that uh, uh, apes do feel envy and that they refuse, reject offers if they see that the other ape has received a better thing. They might throw it back. Well, this is in the very root, and this is not a, only a human problem perhaps, I believe it's not, in the very root of us uh, the missing the rational choice theory. There's been an experiment about this with human beings that when you feel that you're being somehow um, pregnant, I don't have the English word for that, but you're, you're receiving less than you should, then you sort of don't want him to receive anything at all. So this is irrational. This is completely what falsifies the presuppositions of uh, rational choice theory. And this has been proved not only with human beings, but with animals too. So I, I think that in this case, yeah, perhaps this is not really... Uh, this has been done. And you say that there is no... In, in studies like this go even further. For instance, we used to believe that an animal was only conscient if he was able to recognize himself on the mirror. If he could see himself on the mirror and know that it was him, then he is self-conscious. But this is fake, this is false, in a very proper sense. And, and, and the, the researchers have noticed that, for instance, a dog won't notice his image on the mirror because his world is not so visual. 
It has to do with smells and sounds, which the mirror does not give. So he would recognize himself, but not only seeing the mirror. The mirror is too different for him in his world, and he won't pay attention to the images so much. And in his research, he did something. He picked up the P, dot, did uh, P on some places, and he picked up the P of his dog, and P on the snow of other dogs. And he would pick the snow, wet snow from the P, and then he would bring, collect, select, and redistribute the being on the street for his own dog to pass by and his dog would be on the other dog's being but never on his own so he thought he knows that that is him and somehow he's conscious of his himself and somehow his presence and absence so perhaps we are very far from understanding animals and I remember this quote from Wittgenstein which I take for very serious, and which was the title of a book, of a series of conferences about Wittgenstein. Der Löwe spricht, the lion speaks, und wir können ihn nicht verstehen, when we, we understand him not. That, I mean, is much more true than it seems to our first views. The language is so much more than the words and the signs we use, and it's, it's not such a broader view of uh, interaction, that it is a pity that we believe that animals do not have language because they do not have words. So I, I think that perhaps in this sense the broader view of things would be to abandon this idea that we are different animals than the others and under, understand our reactions and our critique and our justification in terms of more deeply rooted, biological and naturalistic view. So my, my pragmatist critic of this idea of human, a normative creature, was that it's too conceptual and yet useless in a sense that distinction between us and the animals does not bring us very farther than what we are now. The, perhaps the way out, the new comprehension, would be to engage this view of, of togetherness in life. I, be, I believe that my, my naturalistic view of things is that it is the fact of motion that brings about freedom. I mean, every animal which can go right or left has a choice. And this choice is not so much the thinking of it and the consciousness, the human consciousness of it, of it. So when we go to neurologists, neurologists analyze our brains through, the, through those scanning machines and they see what happens in your brain when you take a decision. What did they see when they saw that? That decision is taken somewhere down in your brain in a point where we believe conscious is not yet there. So you think you took a decision, you made a decision, but it's not you in the sense you think you did it. But it's you, in a more animal and primitive way, who took the decision. You have justifications, rationalizations in a Freudian sense. But that does not mean that you did what you did. Neurologists even believe that you is just a belief. We are not we in the sense we believe we are. And I think this is a pragmatist view, in the sense that we dismiss categories that really are on the way and not properly giving way to our comprehension. So that would be my critique. Okay. Under 15. Passo então a palavra ao professor Roberto. Terá 20 minutos para responder a ambos. Thank you very much, Fred and Quato. Uh, um, well, I try, I try to address your questions in turn, uh, following the, the order of the remarks. So we start uh, with Fred, and uh, I, 
I think, it, I mean, that uh, Wendell Holmes uh, fits well in this picture because he offers a, an understanding of critique and justification, a sort of uh, contextually situated practices. And so in this sense, uh, it, it, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a different way of, of seeing the, uh, the pragmatist uh, root, rootedness of, of, of Holmes' thought. Precisely in, in trying to uh, to use functional in a, in a functional way uh, this different kind of normative practices according to uh, to the needs of a changing uh, society where problems were emerging and uh, um, and the fact, for example, of saying that the hard cases don't make good law is, is a way of saying. Um, you can engage, you should engage in forms of justification and critique as long as uh, you face a specific problem which requires from you that either you justify a given institution or you provide a critique or you just try to adjust it or whatever else. But, and uh, and uh, so I want to, I'm uh, just making some, uh, I, I think that, that, that we can find, uh, if I'm wrong, not wrong, uh, um, Something similar uh, to what I've been, I've been describing uh, uh, as going on in political theory and in ethics, also in the philosophy of law. For example, if you think of uh, a conception more content of, um, of law as being a sort of foundational science-like system, which is very close to, to the justificatory understanding of, uh, of, um, of democratic theory in political liberalism, for example, where basically you have uh, um, being, of, of being something that, that once it is justified, it can display a sort of full, full-blown deductive power. And on the other hand, in the in, in the field of, uh, of critical legal studies, for example, like in someone like like Koskaniemi, for example, who has a basically a view that norms is just a sedimentation of power. You have a total dismiss dismissal of uh, of any justificatory attempt. A only a sort of a, an endorsement of a sort of uh, critical stance, which is because norms are just instantiation of power, you don't have any, there's nothing to justify to be justified because norms are just foremost concretion of power. So you can all, all, only criticize them uh, under the fact that they um, uh, translate, reproduce forms of, the, of a power asymmetry. So, and, uh, and this is once again very difficult, very different from a pragmatist understanding, which would be, of course, of course, this happens, but you have also justificatory roles and uses for norms, and so it's really the point of the, this battle against uh, the either-or fallacy was to to see, let's see and look case by case. Don't just pretend, don't, don't just assume from the beginning a sort of preconceived uh, attitude towards the nature of norms, of their role, of their um, functioning. So I think in this sense, uh, uh, the philosophy of law may be put within this picture, showing like how, uh, like for example, someone like Postner wouldn't fit in a pragmatist account because of a, of a more uh, a sort of reductive understanding of, of normativity, while someone like Wendell Holmes may probably fit in this neither a science-like understanding in the old positivistic way, neither nor a critical, uh, purely critical uh, understanding of norms, but uh, a middle path in the, in the way exemplified by Wendell Holmes. So I think this may be a, this may help uh, expanding the, the model. Now, um, I think uh, when you when you say that you are making a pragmatist critique, you are right, in the intention at least, <laughs> because uh, pragmatists are natural are naturalists. I mean, they endorse a form of naturalism. Um, pragmatism is a, a philosophy that insists on continuity. This is very clear in Peirce, but also in you, in James, and uh, and your point is exactly that from the point of view of nature, we shouldn't dichotomize. Uh, humans and the other animals. So this is a, a, a pragmatist argument. 
And, uh, uh, and pragmatist says this, even if you endorse continuity, you still need uh, conceptual distinctions. Only conceptual distinctions are functional, so you work out distinction for the sake of specific analysis and arguments. And um, so this is basically, my first reply would be, I, I was trying to articulate a functional distinction for the sake of an argument, and, uh, and not to try to uh, make a, an argument. So I would say I agree with you that there is a very strong continuity, um, evolutionary continuity between the human being and the other animals, and, uh, but uh, you still can, I think, defend the notion of threshold, that is to say, um, you have uh, anticipations, uh, s s very small um, uh, anticipation of, um, of some human traits. This can be done also in another, in another direction. And not, so if, if, when you say that uh, only human beings have culture, only human beings have language, only human beings are social, maybe not this, only human beings have normativity, what, what? One argument may be uh, essentially ontological, which is not mine. Another one would be that uh, as long as uh, culture, learning, normativity doesn't pass a certain threshold, uh, they are sort of very poorly effective in the in the guidance of the life of a species. So of course you can find fragments, and uh, and uh, this is, for example, why the, the work of Franz de Vals is inspiring, but is. Uh, profoundly uh, disputed in, the, in, 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 in biology uh, because it is a very qualitative way of work which most of people just reject because it doesn't make experiments trying to learn to study animals in, uh, well, not in nature because basically I think it works in the zoo. In zoo. And um, so I, I think, if, for example, if you take four, um, four points on which the question of the human-animal issue has been debated, uh, which is uh, this of animal culture, is there any sense of speaking about animal cultures? Do animals have culture? Um, and uh, all the studies, at least those which I know, has tried to, to trace any form of, uh, uh, of transmission, of cultural transmission, because one point of culture is what do you transmit from the one generation to another? Even in the, in the most sophisticated intelligent primate, I, I found just very very scant evidence of uh, some kind of transmission from one generation to another, which is not biological, uh, genetic, but is uh, through learning. Uh, if you take your animal learning, which is another issue which has been debated uh, in, uh, in, in primates, in bonobos, which are supposed to be the closest to us, the scientists have been, have been discussing for 40 years whether in one single event in Japan uh, a group of, of primates did really learn how to wash potatoes. So even if this was the case, uh, the evidence we have about primates learning is that in, in 40 years of uh, observation all over the world, we have seen one event, maybe two or three. So even if this was a real uh, case of, uh, of learning, uh, um, of course you can make the argument that there is no discontinuity, but at the same time, uh, you cannot make anything of, um, of, of learning as being a, a distinctive feature of how uh, this primate uh, live. Uh, on human sociality, you have, you have much more evidence. And for example, the has nice things on, uh, on how primates um, deal with power. And, and so there are interesting studies. So for example, on this case, uh, um, there would be um, it would be much more difficult to, um, to defend the idea that sociality is a, a, a distinguishing trait of humans, uh, not only because you have uh, a sociality in ants and bees, but also because in other primates you have a way of dealing with power, etc., which seems to be um, uh, closer to the way we, we, we deal with power. Um, then also on the question of normativity, um, although I don't know this study on, on, uh, on, on envy, um, I think my argument would be uh, if you don't take the, the, duali the distinction as an ontological dualism and, uh, and you understand it, by the way, as you say, as a, as a, a pragmatist should do, that is to say as a functional distinction uh, useful for, a, for a, um, understanding what is distinctive 
from, for example, for, for an animal species compared to another one in his way of, uh, of living, then I think you can make the case that there is no equivalent of, uh, of normative attitudes uh, comparing something to, as, as I've called the sense of justice, although you may have some, some fragments uh, in, some, uh, uh, in some species which are um, evolutionary very close to ours. And uh, so I think this wouldn't inval invalidate the argument, but of course remind me that in another talk I should uh, be careful of explaining that there are uh, studies which may make ambiguous my, 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 my statement unless I specify that of course uh, there are some elements of uh, uh, some fragments of normativity in, uh, in, anim in other animal species. Ah, bem, ah, veja, nós não poderíamos deixar de, de abrir a oportunidade aos presentes, aqueles que porventura quiserem fazer alguma indagação ao conferentista ou aos moderadores, fica o professor Sérgio Sampaio. É, eu queria fazer uma observação um pouco semelhante à observação feita pelo Torquato, mas é, um pouco numa outra direção. É, quando nós falamos da normatividade como algo antropologicamente definido o ser humano, Talvez fosse interessante uh, acentuar um pouco essa relação que existe entre uma normatividade humana e uma normatividade animal. Sem uh, radicalizar, uh, eu diria que essa diferença e ao mesmo tempo essa semelhança merece ser anotada. Eu vou fazer a referência a Primeiro, um trabalho de um etólogo suíço, Walter Burkert. Walter Burkert, um pouco na direção do Torquato, nos chama a atenção para duas formas de normatividade na ideia, não propriamente de justiça, mas na ideia de retribuição. Ele diz os seres humanos lidam com duas formas de retribuição. E aí está implícita, estão implícitas duas formas de normatividade. Uma é a retribuição que obedece a um modelo vertical, dizer, de cima para baixo, e que nós encontramos nos animais. Ele dá o exemplo dos chimpanzés. Que nós encontramos nos, ani nos animais e encontramos nos seres humanos também. Né? Isto é, a normatividade que um, tem a estrutura da hierarquia, em cima e embaixo. Aliás, o Walter Burkert, num, num dos seus livros, diz que a hierarquia é uma herança primata. Por que o alto é melhor do que o baixo? Ele responde porque um dia nós vivemos lá em cima e lá era seguro, nas áreas, e embaixo era perigoso. Bom, a parte dessa essa questão, uh, existe, ele reconhece, no entanto, algo tipicamente humano, que é a relação horizontal, o modelo horizontal. Esse modelo é um modelo de normatividade uh, em que a, a, a motivação, a discussão, a língua como nós usamos se torna importante. Mas nós lidamos com os dois, com as duas formas de normatividade. E elas produzem efeitos diferentes. E aqui eu gostaria de citar, ou de lembrar, um outro autor, Ascarelli. Ascarelli tem um, um ensaio brilhante, a meu ver, sobre Antígona e Pórcia. Nesse ensaio de Ascarelli, ele, ele analisa as duas formas de percepção de justiça. E 
nos dá uma imagem semelhante a, essa, a esses dois modelos de Walter Burger, o vertical e o horizontal. Antígona é o modelo vertical. Não existe, propriamente diz ele, um diálogo. Um diálogo de Antígona, enfim, com o seu tio. Não? Uh, a, a relação é inamistosa o tempo inteiro. Cada qual se guarda na sua normatividade e o resultado é, um, é uma solidão. Antígona morre só. Né? Como o tio também. Enfim, ela morre só e todos morrem. Na verdade, esse tipo de normatividade, diria eu, é próxima da outra, daquela do animal. E que nos lembra a relação de vingança, retaliação, de que subsiste até hoje. E que se mostra nas decisões que não são propriamente escolhas justificadas, mas são escolhas performativas. Do tipo, eu condeno, eu decido. Do outro lado, Pórcia. Pórcia é a advogada, é a que argumenta, é a que aceita a ordem superior para depois desconstruí-la. É o outro lado. Nesse ensaio, em Ascarelli, as duas formas estão presentes. Portanto, eu não, não lhe faço uma objeção, mas gostaria de ouvi-lo sobre... Não uma radical diferença, o homem é um ser normativo, mas a ideia de que ele é um ser normativo com aspectos diferentes, aceitando a humanidade no modelo horizontal, mas percebendo que nós temos também esse outro modelo, antigo e Pórcia, como exemplos de Ascarelli para mostrar isso. Muito obrigado. Well, thank you very much. Um, to be honest, I have to, to, to think to think about this this suggestion. I think uh, it may be it may be consistent in a way. It gives more flesh to to what Dr. Sopato was saying. I mean, you are right that uh, uh, if you especially if you, as this study suggests, enlarge the scope and the meaning of normativity, um, then it would be easier and maybe more meaningful to try um, to go on a partially different way, which, which, is, to, which is to say um, normativity may be broader than uh, not just human, but having some uh, distinctive human feature. Now, the point would be whether this, for example, this distinction that uh, Burkhardt uh, develops, uh, what kind of uh, scientific evidence has, but certainly, um, it, I think it, it makes, at least it gives a, um, a, um, a suggestion about how to avoid something, by the way, I mean, I, I, I don't like particularly, which is uh, the impression of a dualism, and I, I mean, the fact that you both are making this objection means that I was, in a way, in my way of presenting the paper, I was eating as something which is not formulated in the, in the proper way, and probably uh, using uh, studies in, in this direction, uh, but I think the point is, uh, uh, instead of using, uh, because my, my, my starting point was to to try to root, to, to root something which is very common in contemporary political philosophy to a broader framework. And, uh, and to make it broader, I just uh, limited to the to, to a sort of general anthropology. Now, in a way, you are both challenging me to make the picture even broader. And, uh, and uh, I think that with a strategy like this one, saying if you take normativity as something broader than simply a sense of justice, which, of course, can be done, uh, um, then you can uh, you, you avoid the, the risk of dichotomizing the natural world in the human and non-human, especially because, I mean, Torquato was right, uh, 
this in any case sounds very unpragmatic, un unpragmatist, and, uh, and I don't want to sound unpragmatist, and, uh, because I'm not. So I think, I mean, I, I agree that is a, it, it is a strategy I should, uh, should explore, so thank you. Okay, my question is, is that they permit Professor Newton. É, boa tarde a todos. Vou falar em português, né? Boa tarde, professor Roberto. Boa tarde a todos. É, a minha pergunta é um pouco acompanhando o pensamento do professor Tess, essa relação de poder que existe, que é uma herança que existe da normatividade. Aliás, antropologicamente falando, o direito, as regras sociais elas nasceram dessa relação de poder. Há bem pouco tempo, na, na modernidade, o fundamento do direito fala exatamente no princípio da autoridade, essa relação de impor a norma baseado é, no poder de, de coerção da norma que hoje ainda está na base do, do direito. Mas, após a, a revolução, digamos assim, tanto filosófica, aquela transformação da linguagem no aspecto filosófico, como a transformação jurídica a partir de, 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 daquele livro lançado pelo, pelo alemão é, Tópico e Jurisprudência, Fiver, a gente vê que hoje está é, muito mais próximo da justificação do direito, da normatividade, a democracia a discussão, o fundamento dialético. Eu perguntaria ao professor Roberto, da sua opinião, o que hoje estaria mais próximo da justificação da normatividade? Seria essa relação horizontal ou essa relação vertical, como bem explicou o professor Técio? E aí, nesse aspecto, em que ponto a teoria que está no fundamento da ética do discurso, que é o consenso, o consenso como justificador da normatividade, estaria mais adequado ao mundo atual, onde nós temos toda uma democracia de, de formação de opiniões, com a internet, com o acesso e tal, está ficando cada vez mais mitigado. Então eu gostaria de saber a opinião do professor nesse sentido, em que como, como estaria hoje a justificação da normatividade a partir da crítica e como isso se dá, se estaria mais adequado à questão do consenso ou ainda uma simples relação de poder centralizada. Well, um... Actually, I mean, it's quite a difficult uh, uh, question. My, my sense would be that uh, um, if by normative in this case, if I understand properly, you mean uh, normative theory, not normativity as an object, but normative theory, like for example, in the Habermasian tradition, you are mentioning consensus, I so I, you may also think about this direction of thought. Um, I think the argument would be that uh, under conditions of freedom and equality, we should be the organizing principle of, uh, uh, of modern uh, democracies. Uh, um, the justify, the legitimate um, normative order would be the horizontal one, which, because it is an, a, a, an order which assumes um, that you deal with the human being uh, on a basis of uh, radical equality and uh, freedom. And so in this case uh, you don't have a hierarchy, if not on a sort of um, secondary derivative uh, sense, like in John Rawls, for example, with, with the principle of difference. So basically you, see, you say that uh, social differences and therefore uh, hierarchy are justified only if the ones who are given privilege are accomplishing something on, on behalf and in the benefit of others. 
but of course, on, on the other hand, uh, if your question is more uh, sociological, I think that this vertical model is still absolutely with us. I mean, so society are organized uh, both on a, on a vertical and on a horizontal way, which we... Um, political, social, economic stratification testifies to um, to deeply uh, hier uh, hierarchized relations, and uh, even if you, if you if you look at the at the world of uh, of war, you have, uh, for example, attempting what is being called uh, the lean organization. At structuring uh, uh, society uh, uh, and the work relations upon a, an horizontal, a more horizontal understanding, which in, in, in fact, at a certain, to a certain extent, it happens. So there is, I think, a trend, uh, at least in some part of society and in some state more than in other, and uh, in a very fragmented way, towards a drift from vertical to horizontal. But, uh, this is by no means uh, accomplished or uh, close to be accomplished, but from a, um, also from a political, political philosophical view, like the one you can uh, extract from pragmatism, especially from Jewish philosophy, you would have a uh, normative... ...an intervalo, because we have a fourth break, a intervalo of 15 minutes, no maximum, and I invite all of you, please, to return to assistir à conferência do professor Marcílio, que será presidida pelo professor Francisco Queiroz. Tomem seus assentos é, e vamos dar início a essa conferência de encerramento do primeiro coloque internacional sobre teoria geral do direito e pragmatismo jurídico. Eu Aqui estou, convidado pelo professor Jorge Brau para presidir esta mesa com muita honra e eu faço com, é, em função da deferência do nosso grande professor com o tribunal para estar aqui presente. Na verdade, para mim, é muito difícil participar desses eventos. Eu me lembro quando ouço as palestras de filosofia, eu que vivo estudando tarifa, licitação, essas coisas que não tem a beleza plástica da filosofia. Eu termino essas palestras bonitas, eu ouço o professor Tércio falando as bonitas, e quando termina, algum diz, gostou, gostou, não entendi não, mas ele falou que é é, por isso que estou aqui. E, na verdade, o professor que vai fazer esta apresentação, para a felicidade minha, o professor Marcílio Franca, ele tem vários, vários qualificadores que realmente me deixam muito feliz. Primeiro, é, ele é alguém que consegue fazer um link que é difícil entre esse campo teórico mais difícil e também o campo dogmático pelas atividades que tem, inclusive como é, integrante do Ministério Público junto ao Tribunal de Contas do Estado da Paraíba. É professor da Universidade federal daquele estado, tem é, pós-doutorado, Instituto Universitário do Doutor de Florença, doutorado, mestre, enfim, toda aquela qualificação universitária é importante. Ele faz um link, que é um link muito interessante, acho que vem da veia do Paraibão, Paraíba é essa que já nos fez receber pessoas tão brilhantes como a Ariano Suassuna, eu disse ao seu professor, aqui eu vou apresentá-lo, fazer referência, encurtar o seu currículo, que você quer grande, e dizer que, dentre as coisas importantes do seu currículo, está é conterrâneo de Ariano Suassuna. Quem faz também esse link, né? A pessoa que faz a junção, no acaso do Ariano, da arquitetura, com, com aspectos importantes que consegue coletar a nossa sociedade. E esse, e esse trabalho também o professor Marcílio faz, o senhor Gerão, é o link importante que ele faz entre direito e uma realidade, através de literatura, de certas figuras que são tão, tão presentes e tão marcadoras de, de figuras jurídicas e às vezes a gente olha e não vê. E acho que o grande, maior mérito do professor é exatamente mostrar, nos fazer ver 
aquilo que nós normalmente só olhamos. Eu não vou é, tomar mais o tempo dos senhores, eu estou aqui só para fazer a apresentação e dizer para o senhor que seja realmente bem-vindo, a sua presença sem dúvida valorizará muito esse evento e eu termino por cumprimentar a palestra que não poderia fazer na figura do mestre de todos nós, o senhor Teste Sampaio, que está aqui presente. Então, sem mais delongas, passo a palavra ao professor Marcelo. Boa tarde a todos. É, primeiro, o professor Francisco Queiroz, permite-me dizer que é uma grande honra para mim compartilhar esse painel sobre sua presidência, compartilhar com o senhor essa, essa referência que o senhor é no, no direito público brasileiro. E, inicialmente, registrar a minha, o meu agradecimento ao professor George Brown pelo convite de encerrar essa posição rosa de encerrar esse uh, primeiro colóquio internacional de Teoria Geral do Direito e Filosofia e Pragmatismo Jurídico. Uh, professor uh, George, é com muita alegria que eu atendo o seu convite. É uma honra para mim voltar a Pernambuco e uh, atendo o seu convite, não só vindo para cá, mas também no, no tema que eu pretendo falar hoje à tarde. O professor uh, George, ao me telefonar, ele disse, Marcílio, nós ficaríamos uh, felizes com a sua presença, uh, se você pudesse vir, mas também ficaríamos mais felizes, ainda, mais felizes ainda se você pudesse abordar o tema da arte e do direito. Mas, professor Jorge, isso não é um pedido, isso é uma ordem, já foi devidamente aceito. Portanto, é esse tema que eu pretendo abordar. É, o tema, portanto, da conferência é Janelas da Alma. Janelas da Alma e Espelhos do Mundo, as visões da justiça entre a iconofilia e a iconofobia. O que eu pretendo fazer ao longo dessa rápida exposição é a abordar basicamente esses quatro tópicos que os senhores veem. A, a exposição está concatenada ao longo dessas, desses quatro compartimentos. Um, inicialmente eu quero tratar dessa longa relação entre direito e imagem. Depois eu quero falar uh, especificamente sobre uh, um passo adiante, a, 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 a relação entre direito e palavra. Finalmente, a volta, ou esse pictorial return, à época do direito e imagem, e terminar com algumas conclusões que ressalto desde já, são provisórias. Uh, quando o, o professor George me convidou para finalizar esse, esse congresso, uh, imediatamente eu pensei que seria uma oportunidade justamente para, depois de tantas referências, tantos convidados ilustres aqui ao longo dessas de, das, das sessões de ontem e hoje, por aqui passaram Feg, Peirce, Wittgenstein, Heidegger, Kant, tantas vezes citados, uh, a minha ideia, portanto, ao longo dessa conferência, é ampliar um pouco mais esse diálogo agora, trazendo para o debate com a filosofia e com a teoria geral do direito, não só os filósofos e os juristas, mas também pintores, poetas, enfim, que também têm muito a dizer ao direito. Dizem muito sobre o direito e, por conta disso, dizem também muito ao direito. E para esse diálogo alargado entre a... a a arte e o direito, eu inicialmente uh, tenho que partir do conceito de linha, um conceito tantas vezes é, esquecido na teoria geral do direito, enfim, mas um, um conceito fundamental para as nossas, para a nossa concepção própria de humanidade. Bom, a linha, esse objeto geométrico euclidiano, que tem apenas comprimento, certo? e não tem largura, um conceito nascido ainda na filosofia grega, matemática, naquele tempo em que a matemática e a filosofia se imbricavam, uh, em cujas extremidades estão os pontos. A linha, portanto, ela é delimitada pelos pontos. Início e fim são os... Uh, o ponto de marca, o início, o arqué, e o telos, o fim desse conceito, de linha, que é um conceito, como eu disse aqui há pouco, um conceito relevantíssimo, um conceito de grande complexidade, apesar de sua aparente singularidade, de sua aparente é, nadez, pra... 
Enfim, por que ele é tão complexo? Por que o conceito de linha seria tão importante? Porque linha pode identificar um lugar, se eu traço um círculo, eu divido o dentro do fora, se eu faço, faço um X ou uma cruz, aquele lugar é o meu lugar, enfim, ele pode expressar um movimento, pode imitar, pode reproduzir, aliás, há quem diga que o primeiro desenho surge justamente quando um pai saudoso de um filho que se ausenta marca na parede o registro da sombra do filho, reproduz na parede a sombra do filho ausente, então ele imita, ele reproduz, mas também o conceito de linha constitui, ele cria algo do nada, pode criar algo novo, pode reforçar um conceito, como está aí na tela, sublinhando a minha ideia, pode anular este mesmo conceito. Então, um conceito aparentemente simples, uma linha tem tantas funções. O exemplo disso, Kandinsky, que com linhas, nada mais do que isso, praticamente revoluciona a pintura uh, contemporânea. E esse conceito de linha é um conceito tão importante que há quem diga, como o antropólogo inglês Tim Ingold, que tudo é, na verdade, linha ou produto de uma linha. O que é algo senão o cruzamento de caminhos e movimentos? Caminhos e movimentos são necessariamente linhas. O que somos nós? Eu sou, por exemplo, um filho de mãe filósofa. Isso não é... Isso é uma sina, isso não é um, isso é um currículo. Filho de mãe filósofa, é, você pergunta, mamãe, o que é, o que é tal coisa? Eu nunca tem uma resposta, é pá, pá, pá. É sempre um tratado. Eu sou fruto disso. Para completar essa, essa formação, deixa eu registrar aqui, professor Geraldo, que a minha formação é só em direito. Eu só sou, a minha vida toda, na graduação, mestrado, doutorado, pós-doutorado, eu sou um estudioso, eu estudei direito. Minha formação não é exatamente, eu não sou filósofo, eu não sou um historiador da arte, um crítico da arte. Obviamente que eu, que eu leio, que eu procuro me inteirar, mas o que vocês vão ver aqui são comentários a partir de uma, uma cabeça de um jurista. Nada além disso. Bom, mas isso não quer dizer, para voltar ao raciocínio aqui, de que somos então esse entrecruzamento de linhas e caminhos, enfim, Uh, a minha primeira bolsa de iniciação científica ainda no primeiro ano da faculdade de Direito foi uma bolsa de Filosofia do Direito. Filho de mãe filósofa e bolsista de iniciação científica de Filosofia do Direito, essa, essa busca pelo, por questionar, por debater, por aprofundar, por ver além do visível, tentar enxergar as coisas, moldaram mais ou menos meu percurso acadêmico ao longo, ao longo dos anos. Então, como diz Tim, o antropólogo inglês Tim Ingold, Ingold, o que é algo senão um cruzamento de caminhos e movimentos? Parece que eu acho de uma beleza imensa, também do Tim Ingold, num livro chamado Uma História das Linhas. Everything is a parliament of lines. Tudo é um parlamento, um encontro de linhas. E, na verdade, somos essas linhas. Um namorado que encontra o outro namorado, às vezes uma opção de vida que segue por um caminho que você nem sonhou, enfim, somos esse parlamento de linhas. E esse conceito de linhas, ele é fundamental para o direito também. Na verdade, essa, a linha, essa categoria geométrica fundamental, ela é basilar para diversos saberes e também para o direito. Ora, na, na literatura há a linha narrativa. Na física, a linha do tempo. Na, na música, a linha melódica. Então, esse conceito de linha, para desde já não falar no desenho, na pintura, enfim. Então, o conceito de linha, ele é um conceito fundamental a vários saberes. Mas também no direito. Esse conceito de linha é fundamental no direito porque depende dele a formação de uma série de outras categorias jurídicas. A começar pelo mais fundamental delas, que é a categoria jurídica de Estado. Se não fosse uma linha chamada fronteira, nós não teríamos o dentro, o fora, o cidadão, o estrangeiro. É também a linha, o que define, o que separa, propriedade minha da propriedade sua, enfim. Conceitos, aliás, e o mais fundamental deles no âmbito do direito, o conceito de licitude. É uma linha que separa o lícito do ilícito. Enfim, 
Esse conceito de linha, ele é também central, apesar de pouco estudado, no direito. Há, nos últimos anos, todo um desenvolvimento da, de uma escola francesa e alemã chamada de Geografia Jurídica, Geografie du Droit, ou Geo Jurisprudence, é, uma geo jurisprudência que procura exatamente de, uh, estudar ou avançar esse estudo dessa, dos conceitos de linha de territorialidade no campo do direito. Mas, sobretudo, o conceito de linha ele é fundamental em todos esses campos de saber e também no direito, porque a linha está presente tanto nos sistemas, com, nos sistemas comunicacionais escriturais como letra, como nos sistemas picturais como traço. As formas de comunicar baseiam-se essencialmente no conceito de linha, tanto na letra, a comunicação escrita, como no traço, a comunicação pictórica ou visual. E há quem baralhe isso tudo, como por exemplo esse, esse poema, quadro, de Jacques Dupin e, e Rua Miró, em que eles misturam traços e letras, linhas e, enfim, gestos pictóricos numa única obra de arte. Aliás, isso não é um exemplo isolado, René Magritte também há, em diversos dos seus, dos seus quadros, frases, palavras, misturando, portanto, os limites, embaralhando as fronteiras entre o, 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 o traço e a letra. Então, essa, uh, essa capacidade do traço e da linha caminhar por entre o pictórico e o, e o escrito, aliás, se vocês prestarem atenção, a, 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 a palavra texto, texto vem, poderia ter o mesmo radical de textil. Então, de, as linhas estão presentes em ambos, tanto no texto quanto no textil. Enfim, como é que as linhas nascem? Essa pergunta, apesar de ingênua inicialmente, ela, na verdade, é, por trás dessa pergunta está onde surge a humanidade. Qual a linha divisória entre a animalidade e a humanidade? Na verdade, isso é, é, como nascem as linhas reflete um grande debate entre dois grandes historiadores da arte, o alemão Gottfried Semper e o, e o, e o, e o austríaco Alois, uh, Alois Riegel, que durante o século XIX, boa parte do século XIX, debatem aonde teria nascido, ou como teria nascido a primeira linha. Para o alemão Gottfried Semper, a primeira linha teria sido o fio, quando o homem, nas cavernas, pegou a primeira fibra vegetal, torceu para criar, então, o primeiro tecido. Para o austríaco Alois Riegel, ao contrário, a humanidade teria se apartado da animalidade quando o primeiro homem pega algum material e risca a parede da caverna. Primeiro, a primeira manifestação de linha, portanto, seria o traço e não mais o fio. Bom, fio ou traço, o fato é que a linha, a linha esse conceito importante, é o ponto que saiu para passear, como diz o pintor Paul Klee. A linha é, portanto... A mudança do estático para o dinâmico. O ponto que inicialmente estava parado, ao sair a trajetória do ponto, marca exatamente, o caminho do ponto é exatamente o fato da linha. E está aí Paul Klee, o homem do futuro, esse quadro dos anos 30, em que ele retrata com linhas esse ponto que saiu para passear. Bom... A complexidade da linha, esse conceito tão simples, esse conceito ingênuo, esse conceito pueril, esse conceito, enfim, tão aparentemente pobre, ele é de uma complexidade tamanha que admite uma taxonomia. As linhas não são todas iguais. É possível você classificar as linhas, dividir as linhas. Você tem a linha fio, a tal, imagine uma teia de aranha, um novelo, você pega, você vê ela. A linha traço, você risca, você adiciona material numa parede, como um pedaço de giz, um pedaço de tijolo, você tem um traço. Ou você reduz com um aluno bravo, com um professor que deu uma nota baixa. Pega um prego, risca a lataria do professor. Um traço redutivo. Você ainda tem a linha 
corte, rachadura ou vinco que são as ausências de linha, certo? Você tem um rompimento, aquela linha formada por um terremoto no solo, você vem, vem, vem de repente aquele, aquele oco, aquela nulidade, e finalmente a, a, o quarto tipo de linha, as linhas de ima imaginárias, criações dos homens, os paralelos, os meridianos, as linhas geodésicas, certo? Enfim, se isso só mais para ilustrar quão complexo é esse, esse conceito de linha. Mas a verdade é que essa taxonomia ela só tem valor, digamos, didático. Ela só tem valor meramente uh, educativo, porque há um embaralhamento completo entre essas modalidades. Não é uma coisa cartesiana. A linha ela pode, de linha virar fio, de fio virar linha imaginária, enfim. E como bem diz Paul Klee, nos últimos anos, a linha libertou-se do contorno das coisas e feliz pôde sonhar novas possibilidades. A linha já foi a linha que separa, como, como uh, no campo de futebol ou na Palestina, no Oriente Médio, a linha separa. A linha também é a linha que aproxima, como na costura de um vestido, ou na União Europeia, as fronteiras que aproximam. Enfim, a, a complexidade do conceito de linha é enorme. E, como volto mais uma vez a Tim Ingold, essa, essa complexidade se refere ao fato de que fios podem ser transformados, uh, uh, fios podem ser transformados em linhas e linhas podem ser transformadas em fios. Threads may be transformed into trace and trace into threads, no sentido de que há uma completa mistura entre esses quatro tipos clássicos de linha. E para que isso fique claro, não fique tanto teórico, professor Francisco Herói, para que não ficamos num plano muito filosófico, um exemplo peculiar da minha terra, a famosa renda de labirinto, um pano de linho branco, não sei se alguém aqui já viu isso, um pano inicialmente intacto de linho branco, em que as mulheres chamadas labirinteiras pegam aquele, pegam aquele pano imaculado, virgem, de linho branco e riscam em cima deles um, um desenho qualquer e depois um, uma tesourinha vão a, cortando os fios re, a, dando nó novamente nos fios, reatando esses fios torcendo esses fios e no final o trabalho não tem nada a ver com aquele tecido branco original, sem falar do fato que o próprio nome, renda de labirinto é belíssimo, evocando os labirintos de, de Jorge Luiz Borges afinal trata-se disso a renda, permitam que leia só esse trecho a renda de labirinto, as mulheres labirinteiras riscam um desenho geométrico sobre o um tecido de linho e a partir desse desenho desfiam, retorcem, reagrupam e rebordam as fibras do tecido de linho, realinhando-as e formando uma nova superfície, agora toda decorada a partir do manuseio hábil de lápis, tesoura e agulha. Por meio de um longo e cansativo trabalho de desfiar, reagrupar e refiar o tecido, o resultado é um delicado desenho quadriculado que em nada lembra o íntegro e monótono pano original, criando-se um novo território. Essa, essa possibilidade criativa da linha, primeiro essa, 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 essa qualidade que ela tem de se transformar continuamente em outras espécies de linhas, depois essa qualidade criativa da linha é sem dúvida a sua principal característica. Uma nota é que essas mulheres labirinteiras estão em extinção, e hoje ao que me consta só existem algumas no interior do Ceará, no interior do Paraíba, cada estado do Nordeste tem a sua própria produção de, 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 de renda, enfim, e as labirinteiras se concentram basicamente nesses dois estados. Bom, disse, portanto, que a principal característica da linha era a capacidade de criar territórios. As linhas se transformavam em traços, em fios, em uh, rasgões, em linhas imaginárias, tudo isso estava trançado, tudo isso se interligava e havia essa capacidade da linha criar territórios. Bom, mais uma vez, para que o, o, o conceito não fique, não fique 
não fique pairando sem muita compreensão, a capacidade de criar um território da linha é óbvio quando você imagina o conceito de linha de fronteira. A partir do momento que eu traço uma linha de fronteira, eu crio ali um território, crio dentro e crio fora. Certo? Bom, no direito, essa capacidade das linhas de criarem uh, territórios exerceram um papel importante ao ponto de, tanto como letra, como texto, mas sobretudo como imagem, as linhas terem um papel importantíssimo na construção dos significados jurídicos. Na construção de significados jurídicos. Sobretudo na, numa época em que o direito, ou melhor, sobretudo na época em que campeava o analfabetismo na sociedade, sobretudo numa época em que havia pessoas e pessoas sem acesso ao letramento, numa época em que a imprensa ainda não havia sido inventada, a função figurativa do direito criada pelas linhas era indispensável. Durante muito tempo, eu estou falando numa época pré-medieval, da Idade Média para trás, da Idade Média para trás, o direito ele foi essencialmente visual, imagético. E aí, uma, uma reprodução de uma coletânea medieval de leis, o Sachsenspiegel, o espelho da, da Saxônia, do século XIII, em que vocês podem ver que, ao lado do texto, você tem belas e ricas ilustrações que tentam traduzir ali os conceitos que estão no texto. Como se faz um contrato, como se celebra um casamento. O direito, durante muito tempo, da antiguidade, pré-clássica à, à Idade Média, mais ou menos, não, não com essa simplicidade, mas foi essencialmente um saber visual. E multimídia, o direito foi essencialmente multimídia, porque as manifestações jurídicas elas eram exteriorizadas por símbolos, por gestos, por cores, por, por, por rituais litúrgicos, por rituais, por liturgias, por metáforas, por pinceladas, mapas, traços. Vocês podem imaginar que num tempo em que não havia registro fotográfico, como é que se gravava que alguém casou-se com alguém? Chamava-se as pessoas, celebrava-se determinada cerimônia, dava-se amplo conhecimento daquilo, transmitia-se aquele fato pelas imagens possíveis, por gravuras, enfim. Como é, que, como é que alguém fazia um contrato com alguém? Um selo, uma fita, um traje, para gravar aquilo na memória. Então, durante muito tempo foi essencialmente visual o direito, imagético. O poder das imagens era imenso no direito. Tanto que fala-se que a, uh, essa, esse conjunto de textos e imagens ao longo da Idade Média deu origem ao que ficou conhecido como Uh, jurisprudência picturata uma jurisprudência desenhada certo? A, a eloquência muda das imagens a imagem fala muito por ela mesma dá origem, portanto, a essa jurisprudência pintada daí nasce essa relação longeva entre direito e imagem e se direito e imagem durante muito tempo estiveram tão próximos direito e arte também estiveram muito próximos, essa esse núcleo comum cultural, esse nascimento, essa produção cultural comum entre o direito e as artes plásticas, isso está muito vivo em diversas obras, como por exemplo o Código de Hammurabi, em que você tem escrito nesse, uh, nessa pedra uh, o texto do Código de Hammurabi, mas em cima, esculpido, isso está no Museu do Louvre, acessível a quem, a quem for ao. ao subsolo do Museu do Louvre, do Louvre ah, esculpido em cima o momento em que o Deus dá a codificação a, a, aos humanos, enfim, ao rei, aos humanos. E ah, essa proximidade, esse entrelaçamento entre arte e direito, por conta dessa necessária visualidade. O direito tinha que ser essencialmente visual, antes da invenção da imprensa, diante do analfabetismo das pessoas, por todas essas razões. O Código de Amorato foi encontrado por uma expedição francesa em uh, 1901, na região da antiga Mesopotâmia, co co correspondente à atual cidade de Susa, no Irã. Bom, e essa uh, visualidade do direito, ela é assinalada, sobretudo, em, em diversas obras, 
naigar de vermelho é o direito. A expressão visual do direito, ela, digamos, é sublinhada ou reafirmada em diversos espaços públicos, sobretudo. Como, por exemplo, essa antiga fachada da igreja de Nossa Senhora da Conceição Velha de Lisboa. Só, hoje em Lisboa só há praticamente um, um portal e que você vê essa antiga justiça com esses olhos bem vivos. Aliás, não é à toa porque... É, isso está na fachada de uma, de uma igreja, que obviamente vocês podem imaginar que na Idade Média o, o, o mix, essa confusão, melhor dizendo, entre as instituições civis e as instituições religio, religiosas era completa. Então, nada mais óbvio do que você esculpir como deveria ser uma justiça de olhos abertos, vivos, na fachada de uma igreja medieval. Uh, isso está um pouco... Essa concepção de justiça que vê muito, essa concepção de justiça de olhos uh, vivos, de olhos te 